have a joint meeting of the Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals scheduled. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite the Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Brad Blanchett, to call this meeting to order. Yep, the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals meeting for a uh, special meeting for Tuesday, October 1st, has uh, come to order. Okay, great. Just as we get started here, um, I think uh, I'm excited that we can all get together. I think that um, for the Planning Board, what we've, what we've been doing, looking at each month, is the different zoning bylaws that we'd want to bring to town meeting, either next year or in the future. And certainly, as we look at the different um, zone, possible zoning amendments, we have our own perspective, what's going on in our front line, but we don't necessarily have that feedback loop of what's going on on the DBA front line. So I think um, as part of coming together today, it's a good opportunity for a discussion to get that full 360 degree view of what's going on with our bylaws, how they're being applied on our respective front lines. We obviously cover different areas, but we also cover some of the same areas. So maybe just opening up a discussion and having that feedback loop that we can all get together and roll our sleeves and have a good productive discussion about this. So Brad, do you have specific goals or anything that you want to Yeah, so I mean, first of all, I think it's great that the two boards are getting together. I can't recall, I mean, I'm, I'm not one of the senior members, more of a junior member of when Planning Board and Zoning Board got together, uh, but really just like opening the dialogue and looking back into our history of decisions on um, things that uh, we'd like to see potentially change, things we'd like to see up upgraded, um, and just review of, of some of these decisions and, and bylaws, whether that uh, the decisions we liked, we didn't like, and things that we'd like to see changed um, as far as maybe updates in the amendments, uh, re re review of the table uses, and um, training opportunities is a big one. I know I've found uh, one of those, and it's been really helpful in things that um, the zoning board, uh, how much leverage we have over certain decisions and uh, um, conditions and things like that. So really just keeping it an open dialogue and really looking at uh, different uh, backgrounds of each individual, like Paul's on open space, so bringing some of your open space experience to the table. Bram, the master plan, of course. Mark and Dick, you guys are the senior members, so you guys know a lot of these decisions and these bylaws uh, in and out. And Leslie, you've been on both boards, and then Jeff, your, uh, your, uh, your um, attorney background as well would be helpful. So keep in mind when we're having these discussions and what we can bring to the table. Just in terms of, I guess, housekeeping, um, I think what Brad and I talked about maybe the best way for us to work together is just to open it up for a discussion, maybe not be as formal, just be able to have a productive discussion and, um, and talk about things that we don't have to necessarily be called on or anything like that. And we'll, we'll just sort of facilitate through the agenda different areas to cover. We do want to end promptly. We're scheduled for 8.30, so we'd like to just keep an eye on the time and I'm sure we could talk about bylaws at the end of time but just so that we can, um, you know, at least touch upon a couple things. I think if we, if, if we walk away with a couple things that we're, we're finding based on the fact that, you know, we all are bound by the same book. We probably, we all want to make good decisions. We all have those sleepless nights. We all have those applications that are still in the back of our mind. So, you know, if we can kind of bring some of that to the table and talk through them, I think that, that would be great in and of itself. Um, <coughs> So let's see, we wanted to do end of 8.30. Oh, and also, uh, you know, this, this obviously is a general discussion. We don't want to be specific to any open applications or anything before either board. So it's really not to talk about, debate any sort of applications. It's more about talking about the bylaws and what we're experiencing, if there's any areas that we, throughout time, have wished maybe were a little clearer or things that we see approved all the time that maybe we should just be a bylaw so that it's not a special permit or vice versa, maybe something that's always denied. So let's talk about what we can change there to just make it a little clearer for everybody, our, the board, the applicants, everybody involved. So with that, um, if there's anybody who's actually already thought about this and has something that they want to really bring up and talk about, um, certainly the floor is yours. As far as like, just any of the bylaws, if there's any, any ones that are currently written. Yep. Yeah, they're currently written. Hi, Michelle. We're just getting started. Oh, good. Um, I think maybe just to, you know, we don't have details on this tonight. It's coming up at the November planning board meeting. But um, just so that the DBA knows, the planning board is looking at um, 
for the solar bylaw, um, for you know large scale solar bylaw for town meeting this year, and also a hazardous waste facility bylaw. So those are two things that um, the, the board has started to work on with um, the Regional Planning Commission's assistance. So the, um, the board had one just very general discussion with Central Mass Regional Planning Commission, and then they're gonna come back to the November uh, 5th um, planning board meeting, when hopefully they're gonna have some drafts for us. Um, I, I dusted off the, I, I haven't gone out to, uh, to, to the planning board yet, but I dusted off the, you know, file off from about 2014, 13 or 14, I think it was, um, that we had brought to town meeting for solar. Um, so those, are, so those are two, I think, pretty definite, five, you know, big new bylaws that the that the board, that the planning board is is taking a look at, uh, already for town meeting. Okay, but I, I mean, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think one, an easy something to, to talk about to try to get uh, dialogue is signs. Now, in 2015, we, we redid, we revised our zoning bylaws related to signs in 2015, yet in 2018, we had 12 sign variances, so we either didn't address what the need was or we need to look at it again, but certainly signs, we spend a lot of time granting dimensional um, Variances for signs. And that's a pretty straightforward process. Yeah, I, I would say just to go on that, uh, you know, the sign, if I remember correctly, a lot of the sign variances that we were granting were in like the shop's way area, which felt like it was away from downtown and didn't, that area was different than like, say, signs that you necessarily would want in downtown. So whether or not, you know, having signs in certain areas have certain variance restrictions or guidelines, and then signs in, say, downtown have different variances. I mean, it, it could be a possibility because I think we can all agree, or maybe not, but, you know, what happens at Shop's Way is completely different than what happens, say, downtown. Mm -hmm. In terms of the type of businesses or the types of viewing that people want, want to see for signs. Mm -hmm. Well, the other aspect of that, too, is a lot of these variances were the fact that the uh, property was on a corner, so they had problems with visibility in multiple directions. So that if they, you know, our, our sign law seems to be designed for a, uh, a commercial property along the road rather than a commercial property on the corner where they want a few direct, they, for safety, they want to highlight where their business is, but they're restricted by saying, well, which side do we want the traffic on and which side do we leave open? Um, I know that was a case with both CVS and I think your mm -hmm. property as well. Yeah. And sometimes it has to do with the scale of the building. Yeah. You know, I mean, here, you know, very, yeah. here's something very interesting, just looking at this real quick, and I can, um, uh, you know, get, get you more details on this. Um, because I'm assuming that you're probably going to have more joint meetings, um, uh, but the in 2018, of those 12 signs, only three were for Shop's Way. So, so that's very interesting to me. Um, so what what I can do if that's you know, I know we just started, but you know that's something that um, you know in house I can take a look at what those what those sign variances were. You know, was it for height, was it for width? Um, I mean, those are the two major, you know. Um, and, and see if there's something consistent, at least with, you know, nine of those. And what you have, um, I probably should have explained this at the very beginning. I mean, it's sort of self-explanatory, but um, the, the sheets that you have in front of you um, are, and disregard the yellow, the, the, that meant something when we first did these, but it doesn't mean anything for you tonight. Um, but this goes back to 2002, which is you know pretty far back to look at. But since we had the data, we wanted to give it to you. So we updated, I think, three years for, for, for you tonight. Um, so you've got 2019 to, to date, and there's two you know, open hearings on there. Um, and like Carrie said, you can't really specifically speak to those, but um, so we don't have those. Um, uh, we, we have a variance for one of those. It has been granted, but the other two, 
125 Rice and 425 Whitney are ones before the planning board, ones before the ZBA. But so each one of these is broken down into um, how what kind of special permit was granted um, and or what kind of variance was granted. And then again, I can give you, I have two years worth here just for me for cheat notes tonight, but um, you know, any one of these that people want to know, you know, what specifically was granted, you know, we, we can do that. Um, I, I can do that through an email to everybody or and or your next meeting, you know, however you want to do that. So when we looked at the signed bylaw last year, we focused a lot on the electronic portion more than anything else. So from your perspective, is it specifically as it relates to dimensional type variances that are really like coming through or, or is it related to electronic at all? I think it was more electronic and dimensional, wasn't it? Science might be something for a later date. I just want to have a chance to dig into it a bit and see what we did approve and deny. So, so, so then it's exact. I mean, do you already have, besides the solar and the hazardous waste, are there ones that you were going to move to tweak that you wanted to focus on those versus, uh, to Andrew's point, just you know, throwing stuff at the wall? Because um, we haven't done any analysis on any of them. We just have the spreadsheet. Well, one there. Oh, you go ahead. Oh, one other thing that, but we just started talking about at the last meeting, goes back to Shopsways too, is the underlying zoning of Shopsway is industrial, and that's trucking and warehouses, and we're thinking of changing that zoning to commercial to fit in the area now because now it's it's becoming commercial. You would hate to all of a sudden have a trucking by right pop in and be like, oh, it's going to change the whole area. Well, so that was another thing to look at. Is um, I think we have an overlay for commercial on there, Kathy, don't we? Yes. Yeah. 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 So we maybe you flip it, right? You make the overlay industrial so you don't lose that opportunity in case some unique um, visit, you know, business comes in there. And the underlying is basically all commercial. You know, something like that. Um, there might be an opportunity right on Route 9 where an industrial would fit in. I mean, we just don't know how that whole area is going to pan out over the years. But it definitely looks like it feels like it's going to be all commercial. Mm -hmm. Right, because industrial is more warehousing, trucking, natural resource extraction, fuel storage. It doesn't seem like any of that would fit there anymore. And Route 9 has its own highway business district. Right. So this would just be shops wood area. Well, and you have to know how far the old district goes. But in terms of the ease, the need for special permits or variances if we made it commercial, with the exceptions being industrial versus industrial being allowed and commercial being an exception. But I don't know how far does the overlay go? Does it go like to the sand people? But I would guess. Okay, that's Yep, let me uh, talk amongst yourselves. Let me look at that. Up. On page 67, um, it, uh, it talks, the applicability is, is that the major commercial development overlay district uh, is superimposed on land in the industrial district in the vicinity of the Southwest Connector. So it left it semi-loose. Um, because again, they need you know the board's permission. Um, uh, it's the zoning board of appeals for this one. Um, so you know there's some leeway that if if someone, I guess you know maybe closer to town, 
um, thought that it might be appropriate for their industrial zone land, you know, it would be up to the board as to whether or not, you know, they would approve the overlay district to be applied on that on that property. But certainly the intent was the, the you know, the shop sway area, the where the baseball fields are, um, you know, the um, basically I, I think from sort of Tomlin Hill Road to Route Nine. Anything on that map? Is there any map? I mean that they're well, but it, it just describes it um, in the vicinity of the Southwest Connector. So, you know, it, again, it, it is from, you know, Tomlin Hill, you know, to nine. But the entire industrial district up there did not get the entire overlay, or it did? Was it intended well, to be the entire? Because there's, I mean, you can see on the zoning, the six one, you can see the pink is industrial, but did the entire industrial area get the overlay? Well, again, it, you know, there's there's leeway for for the for the for the you know application of it, um, but yeah, I mean, looking at the um, you know the zoning map, you know, again, you're you you are talking from you know Tomlin Hill Road, you know, south. But for the industrial, there's no real leeway because it's all if you look down industrial, they're all yeses, so they're okay. permitted by right. Sure. So then it wouldn't come before anybody, and then we'd be surprised, like, how did that get there? <laughs> well, the, 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 um, the, the good thing about, you know, when you bring water and sewer, you know, to a site, the value of the land is, mm -hmm. is increased, like, you know, exponentially. So you're, you're probably not going to see an industrial user there because they can't afford the real estate. Um, I mean, generally, that when you add, you know, infrastructure, it's, you know, there's certain uses that automatically, you know, it doesn't make sense economically for them to be there. by right and a new gravel pit by exception. So, so I mean, looking at, at, at revising the bylaw to, I don't know what you can actually flip, I have no idea whether that's a cost issue would do, but that's what makes sense, right? And then I also think just in that whole area with the land that's behind Bigelow's and everything, eventually someone's going to uh, figure out the engineering to get access to it. That's an excellent housing area. So you could actually see a big development of like mixed use back, back there where you would have housing. So I don't know if it comes that far up or is that different, Kathy? No, that's actually zoned. Um, the I know the map is very faded, but that's actually zoned. It's north of the pink in the right. down in the lower left hand corner. So it's all zoned residential, and um, and probably about half of that, you know, between Shrewsbury and the Southwest Cutoff and West Main Street. Probably about, maybe about half of that is owned by the state um, as flood storage um, property. So what you have is, you know, everything that's developed around Times Square. Uh, there's still some land there, though, around Times Square. Um, actually, believe it or not, behind Times Square. Does people, I don't know, I might be dating myself by calling it Times Square, but where Romaine's, yeah. where Romaine's is. So behind <coughs> Romaine's, there's still um, a... a, a a good chunk of business property that has access alongside um, uh, heading towards Shrewsbury um, has access alongside of what, what's the last store there, the barber shop, I think. So there's a, there's a, they have access and frontage out on West Main Street yep. there. So that potentially could be more commercial development. But then, you know, heading, you know, towards Shrewsbury, heading west, um, you have, um, you know, a lot of that is Bigelow property and Zecco property. And so, like you said, that's its own residential. And then there's an overlay district um, specifically for that area of town for a, a um, residential overlay district that would um, allow, there's a lot of wetlands in there and um, hence the flood storage that's in there. Um, so the, the bylaw, which has not been used, it's only for that area of town. Um, you know, has density bonuses 
and then, uh, but extra open space would be preserved. So that's presently, a, you know, an existing bylaw. I didn't know if that went all the way up to Shopsway, but it doesn't. No, but it um, it actually the the residential abuts. Um, Crystal Borgatti land back the, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, I was just gonna say you, if um if. if if you haven't noticed it, you now will notice it. <laughs> um, when you go up the secondary access to Shops Way, there's a gate and there's a small access that just like just stops at the at the you know top of the hill. Um, and um, you know that I believe that they put that in there for you know potentially uh, you know either acquisition of some of the Bugatti land or or all of the Bugatti land, but the rest of the Bugatti land is. Um, oh, is residential. Okay. So well, the reality of those that component, the Beta Lake and the Addy, it would likely be somebody, an entity, to combine those properties. So I mean, it's just something that should be on the radar, no matter what, if it's today or ten years from now. That specific override. Well, I, you know, whatever we're doing with this, I mean, just. I didn't even say changing anything, just it should be something that we should have our eye on because it's a huge piece of property. If somebody were to combine those properties, if they were able to do that in some manner, which I think they can. Yeah. But that's all residential, so that has nothing to do with the commercial overlay no. district on the well, industrial. Well, what did you say the overlay is on that? Did you just say, that? oh, you said the density bonus land. Well, it's got, it, it's on, it starts on page 69 of the zoning. It's called the residential open space. Planning overlay district, and it was specifically. Um, oh, wait a minute. Nope, nope. I take that back. Um, that is for resident B. Um, the one that is for the garden property. <coughs> I think it is resident field. Okay, mm -hmm. um, is it red? Oh, okay. All right, then that is okay. Yeah. The other one is is for there's another open space overlay district. Um, but yeah, okay. Thank you, Amy. This one is yeah. This is the one that's specifically um, for again the vicinity of the Southwest Connector. And does everyone know what, what, when I say Bogatti's, does everyone know, that, I mean, that's, that's just a person's name, but they, they owned, actually, um, it's a family from Shrewsbury that basically owned all the land from the um, Route 9, Route 20 uh, interchange all the way through to West Main Street next to Ward Hill in Shrewsbury. So there was, you know, it's hundreds of acres. And about half of it, they sold back in the early 2000s to Kevin Giblin originally. And that was the very start of what's now known as, you know, North Boat Crossing and where the Avalon apartments are. And the rest of it is still, the, the residential portion is still owned by the family. Um, one area that, if, if, is there anything else on the overlays? Uh, one area that I've identified, I think, um, in just through different various hearings for special permits is the criteria. Um, I wasn't sure if that's an area where planning board or DBA finds challenges in their current criteria. If they're, you know, it, so in some of the classes that I attended uh, last year, they talked about the criteria for special permit. You should review it and, you know, frequently, make sure it's up to date, make sure it's um, supporting what you want in the town. But then also they talked about, if you have a certain mitigation in place, uh, you, you'd be in a better spot if your special permit criteria supported it. So for example, if part of your criteria was safety for pedestrians and bike traffic, then you'd be better aligned to create, you know, if, they were, if you were to ask a developer to put in sidewalk as part of a mitigation piece because it was actually in your special permit criteria that that was a condition so that you would be better positioned to put mitigation in place. So I don't know if that's anything, if, if either side wants to speak to our current criteria, if how it's impacting um, our decisions or if it needs to be tightened. 
it up or expand it or anything like that. So, so you can also do that through the master plan, which is the first criteria, where it says the proposal is in substantial harmony with the North Shore master plan. Mm -hmm. So I think this master plan frame, correct me if I'm wrong here, but has a section or a point on there about pedestrian safety, bike lanes, and that sort of thing. That's mm -hmm. already on there. And if something is in the master plan as like a goal five, 10, 15 years from now, as a zoning board, you know, we can ask developers today in the master plan, put in uh, sidewalks oh. for whatever reason. And we actually, we, the class we went to in April, we, we asked um, one of the lawyers there, Alana Burke, about specifically that. If it's in the master plan, can you ask as conditions or whatever the case may be to be able to do that? Now, I think, Kathy, you, I had asked you this, and you had brought up the fact of if you do make a special permit with a condition for something like putting in a sidewalk, the developer typically doesn't follow through, right? Well, the, it, it, and, then, and then it gets a little. Yeah, it, or if the, you're asking them to do something that costs extra. Yeah, yeah, and the and the sidewalks is um, as as much as and the, the planning board has been a huge proponent of sidewalks, um, but the issue that we're facing, and you know, and there's there's got to be a way around this, but I. I don't know t tonight to offer a solution, but it, but there's got to be a way around this because what what happened um, in the past couple of years and why we had to you know advise the boards to stop asking for sidewalks on Route 20 was that um, the Mass DOT uh, has policies where they they won't take responsibility for the sidewalk if it's sort of like a lot by lot, which is what we were doing, you know, as, as a, you know, a small, say, uh, you know, like 109 West Main Street, you know, some of Tim Shea's properties right near the Marlboro Savings Bank, um, you know, those would have been perfect candidates to put a sidewalk in front of, so that, you know, with the hope that eventually all these pieces, you know, connect. Um, but the, um, and this is, they didn't do this just in Northborough, this isn't unique to Northborough, but Mass DOT, um, started realizing that that's what some towns were doing if you couldn't get a full blown, you know, uh, you know, redo of, you know, route, you know, nine or route, uh, route 20. And it, so in our town, you know, it is route 20. And so they said, unless the town wants to take all the responsibility for that, you know, like 100 feet or 150 feet of sidewalk, then, and the, the town had to sign, um, you know, you know, a legal document with Mass DOT that we would take on that responsibility. And so, you know, the town, I, I think rightly so, said, why would we do that? It's not our street. You know, we don't plow it, we don't maintain it. Um, so, um, so then Mass DOT said, well, we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna approve the sidewalk design. So that's, that's a standstill that we're at and have been for a few years, which is why in particular the planning board um, you know, can't require sidewalks on Route 20. Just out of curiosity, all the sidewalks that were put up in Westboro on Route 9 there? Yeah, that's where I was going. You know, who, did Westboro agree to do that? No, that's a whole mass DOT. It's called, that whole project, the, the redoing of the Lyman Street intersection, that's been, um, that has been on the, what's called the TIP, the Transportation Improvement Plan for the state. So there, there's a TIP throughout the whole state and each district then has projects. We're in district three, so that, that project has been on the tip forever and ever. It's just like when we got the signals downtown and we had the sidewalks redone, that was all part of the state project. So I get that, but but did they ask um, Westboro to, for the ownership of it or did the state say no, that's only for like Route 20? Did they did they do the same thing with Westboro? Oh, as far as oh no, because I think it's, it's miles of sidewalk that they've just recently okay. put in. So I would assume that that's, that that's all state maintained because you know, Westboro doesn't do anything with Route 9. Um, I can, you know, I'll check and follow up with Westboro on that, but, um, but that's, that was all part of you know, a huge, like if we, if we, for some reason, you know, I mean, it was <coughs> years from now, um, but say we had, you know, I don't, you know, six miles of Route 20 that we needed to have redone, um, then you would incorporate, you know, that would be your opportunity to incorporate sidewalks and whatever else, you know, into that plan. Mm -hmm. You know, different kinds of street lights, you know, things like that. 
Um, just to your comment, in the former master plan, there was sidewalks in there. But we still ran into the problems. It's just a complicated thing that we have to figure out how to get around it. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to put some meat behind it so that we can either ask a developer or somehow, you know, through the master plan that we have coming right now, get some funding to make it happen. Um, I think, you know, just along the sidewalk, when um, b between MassDOT and um, the Department of Revenue um, came out against the, the um, well, actually not DOR, um, our auditors um, had suggested for several years in a row that the way that we were collecting money um, from developers, like in lieu of sidewalks, say on, you know, the one half of a cul-de-sac um, in a residential neighborhood and say that sidewalk, you know, was valued at, you know, $5,000. So $5,000, the, the planning board would waive that portion of the sidewalk and that $5,000 would be put into an account for, for future sidewalks. And um, our auditor, um, explain to us that that we could that we, we couldn't be doing that as a as a municipality there had to you know you have there has to do impact fees or there has to be another mechanism to collect that money so at the time um, the I had conversations with the DPW director and the town administrator and we had talked about um, that what we could could do to solve the sidewalk problem um, the funding and the actual construction of it is that um, you know every I'm just gonna throw out five years, but say every five years, you know there would be a capital item um, at town meeting voted on at for you know again these are just you know fake numbers, one hundred twenty five thousand dollars worth of sidewalks and they're going to be placed on you know these six streets, you know so it would be a town meeting vote and then the town would go out to bid and have those sidewalks created, but those would be on our streets. In the town on the street. I just thought something about sidewalks too, and you know how you said that on Route 20, the state said that we would have to sign a waiver that we'd be in charge of them. Could you ask the developer to put in a sidewalk and also make the condition that they're in charge of buying it? No, we tried that. <laughs> we tried the developer once. Nothing to do with that. So, so we did. We tried that as a workaround. What about even criteria that say, um, I've seen other towns' criteria, and they have things like based on municipal services, so that provided that water and sewer can support it, or other municipal services can support it. Is there anything like that that we'd want to consider as part of our criteria? Or anything else, really, I'm just throwing things out there. A assuming that this makes it, for me, I've noticed in the past that this can be a little great because a lot of these things are a little subjective or based on my opinion, but I wish there was something more black and white for me to think about. I don't know if anyone else has felt that way. As an attorney, are there any special permits we kind of like, well, didn't really agree with, but granted because of these seven criteria, is there any other type of criteria we're looking to add, like one beat on the bone? Um, I know we, last year we changed from shall to may. So it's not under the assumption that every special permit gets granted. It gives us a little more um, leeway there. So is there anything else you guys think of? Um, to be added to the criteria? There's just one section, um, one particular article that the AG has asked for an extended time on, um, and that has to do with um, a special oh, permit. Non right. 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 Well, I mean, I, it's really hard because I think they're, they're loosey goosey for a reason um, because of the balance between what we want and property rights your owner's rights, but I don't know how you, I mean, I don't know how you change it. I mean, I guess if there were certain, you know, samples in the, in the class that, you know, right. would meet the AG's, you know, scrutiny, do we want to make it more, um, 
restrictive on the, the um, more challenging on the property owner and their right to develop so that it is something that from a town master plan standpoint is what we think we want to see there. But and how you word it or what you add to it. But I think like, so, so like for number one, and try to keep the premise at the end, but like when it says like insubstantial harm is the norm for master plan, the fact that we like have just done it, you can literally reference in your decisions whether you are for or against it, like the actual master plan saying like, you know, I mean, obviously this master plan is 12 pages, if not longer. So if there's something that's for or against it, that whatever's first your permit, like it's very, the master plan is supposed to be, obviously it's a town focused sort of project that's, you know, you guys have spent two years, 18 months, mm -hmm. something, like something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be more representative of what the people of this town really do want in this town. Obviously there's prior prioritations <coughs> That, that accompany everything, and it's supposed to be the catch-all. Mm -hmm. So having that obviously as a criteria, I think, is, is a good sort of catch-all for criteria that in, in which we can use as a board to mm -hmm. accept or reject. Okay. Saying, like, specifically, this is project is agrees with what the master plan's intent is, or it does not. Uh, and I think on, if you look at it you know, big like that, on a macro level, that makes sense, but when it gets down to an actual project, an application in front of us. Um, number three, the use as developed will not adversely affect the neighborhood. That's a hard one. That's probably one of the most difficult because you want to, it's very difficult to weigh what the neighbors all thought and want in their, you know, little area of town and what is, <coughs> is a reasonable interpretation of will not adversely affect the neighborhood. I mean, because it's always, it's all about perspective at that point because this is my neighborhood, so I actually think it does adversely affect, but the zoning board has to look at it really in a, in a more neutral way. And that's probably one of the more challenging, but I don't know, it's not like you can get rid of it, and I don't think you can, I, mean, I don't think you put more teeth into it, but that is the one that, um, you know, causes the most, you know, conversation. Well, it's interesting. So I, so I definitely hear what you're saying about the master plan, but then when you see the applications, every applicant likes yes. No one's going to say no, it's not. But did they have even read the master plan? No. Probably, I assume not. So if the burden of proof is on the applicant to some extent, how do you even meet that criteria? Well, you they should have to cite it just like they do the rest, <laughs> right? I mean, why not? Why, don't, why can't that be a question on the application? We ask them to cite the reg. Site where in the master plan you think this is in harmony. I don't think that's yep. uh, you know I agree unreasonable. Yep. The burden proof is always on the applicant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in fairness, we do sometimes take their word for it. <laughs> it's, 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 right. To be totally honest, we do. Right? We don't think that you know they're intentionally trying to stick it to us. Well, now that you know they master plan backwards and forwards. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I do, I think that's just another question on the application, right? You know, please cite, just like you do the zoning bar. Simple. I know I did go to a special permit class too, and I don't have the papers in front of me. So if we do meet again, maybe I want to go back and read it and see what they have for suggestions. Because mm -hmm. I can't remember off the top of my mm -hmm. head, but they probably were some good ones. I think much to what you said, Fran, like um, maybe go a step further when you talk about, because a lot of times neighbors will come in even to us and say how it does affect their neighborhood. So maybe you say, show us proof on how it doesn't affect traffic wise. You know, um, sound, you know, you hear, is it sound? Is it traffic? Is it visual stimulation, lights? You know, how is your project not going to? You know, simple enough. Um, I've gone before the design review committee. And we know that for lighting, everything stays on the property, right? Mm -hmm. You know, for traffic study, I'm willing to do a traffic study. Mm -hmm. And then simple things like that, maybe you could add it a step further so then the neighbors realize before the applicant gets before the ZBA that a lot of their concerns have already been addressed, mm -hmm. right? They think that there would be traffic, um, increased traffic, but they realize that it's only two cars versus the 30 cars that they imagine. You know, something like that, or vice versa. They, the ZBA finds out it's going to be a significant amount of traffic. Mm -hmm. Any other areas? Any 
anything with setbacks or buffers between zoning districts or anything like that? Um, yeah, actually, I was just thinking about this recently. Yes, setbacks and buffers. Um, we've had some, a couple applications recently um, that residential is a budding uh, business. Um, and I don't expect residents to understand this until there's an application in front of them. But maybe there is a way to help grow the business of Northborough while also keeping that small town feel, making sure the residents are, are happy and content. Um, because as a zoning board, we're only we're presented with a certain application. Would we want a coffee shop, a bookstore, in place of some of these other things? Absolutely. As a resident, absolutely. But it's not a us to make that decision. It's something the application in front of us, we have to decide on that application. And I think it would be easier on everybody um, to have, I, mean, I think, more of a buffer zone between those districts. So I'd like to make a, a comment about that. So um, over the years, you know, we talk a lot about creating natural buffer zones, which is, you know, you have like 100 or 200 feet of no cut or whatever you got of no cut. The problem with that is, um, and if a, a, a developer comes in and says, great, I have no problem, I'm going to do landscaping or whatever, you know, one of my issues is that landscaping is only valid for one year. And I remember this distinctly with Walmart. When I went in, they were supposed to do all this landscaping on the side. That was great. If the trees die down after a year, they're gone. We have to, the town has nothing to stand on. That's all that they're required to keep it up for a year. Same with any commercial. So we might want, as a board, look to extend that, you know, forever or, you know, within a reasonable amount of time. Sure. Because if you do have like a clear cut for, and then you get some sort of um, business going in or industrial and then that guy says I'm going to do 25 feet of you know, new trees or whatever and they don't take but they take for one year, then it's gone and there's no, nothing between the buffer between the homeowner and the commercial. Mm -hmm. So um, that's true, Kathy, it's just one year, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think it would be really valuable to look beyond that and say must be at least 10 years, you know. And then it may be even to go to the extent of where you get into a little nitty gritty and there's a certain circumference of the tree. You know, you're not putting the baby trees in, you're putting in decent size. So that, you know, then the then the residents feel like, okay, now I'm sort of protected. The, um, just, you know, for, for everyone's reference, the buffer, the site design standards for commercial and industrial um, start on page 82, but as far as landscape buffers, um, it's 83 and 84. Um, to, you know, I mean, whether you want to continue talking about that or just for future reference, but um, that's where it talks about, you know, um, what needs to be between business and residential, business and business, and, and business and industrial. I don't think there, I think it, 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 I think it was discussed, but it's so specific, you know, where, again, where you get, you know, the master plan is up here, and, you know, um, and then every, you know, everything filters down into the various boards, and um, so I don't think the master plan, like, ends up having a recommendation about the buffers per se, but probably about, maybe more about development being in harmony, you know, and then you get into the, you know, you, you get into the specifics of, okay, well, how does it, how do you make it in harmony? Well, that's one of the things, you know, providing buffers. And then the other thing you have to think about, or should think about, um, is, you know, when you, when you look at, say, buffers as an example, um, and, you know, a lot of times people will just visualize, oh, well, it's, you know, it's 25 feet. Well, wouldn't it be great if it was 50 feet? So, but what you have to then think about is, then you have to look at your setback, and you have to look at your impervious coverage, 
and you know, just by increasing your, your buffer, you think, oh, that's gonna help with the sound, and you know, it's gonna look prettier. Well, what you've just done is reduce the building envelope, you know, for, <coughs> for whether it's commercial, industrial, or residential. And, and, and you might end up making the lot, you know, undevelopable, and that, and you can't do that, you know, through your regulations. You, you can't render a piece of land, you know, un, undevelopable. So, just something to keep in mind. Um, that it's you know it's always a compromise, but um, but any any regulation that we add, you know we we have to look at um, and like in ho in house we always do an analysis of you know what does that um, uh, you know what does that do how how many lots does that affect and then you know on a, on you know looking at the, the the acreage on the property and again you know what does that do to the building envelope. And do you, you end up making it impossible to put in drainage in a parking lot and a building. Any more comments from the zoning board on the buffer zones and things like that? Well, we've run into that a lot. And it's funny that you got industrial business right yeah. at this point. Immediately behind it are small residential lots. Yep. And the business lots that are not filling up a lot of depth, they end up all right there. We run into that a lot. Even people in the residential, they want a buffer, they want a lot of trees, but there's no room. You have to just say, yeah. uh, that's a lot of small yeah. things. Yeah. That's true, too. I mean, that's, yeah, you got to strike that balance. Yeah. We do definitely want to develop, especially downtown. I know that that's not. Well, another thing that everybody. you can look at as you get closer to the downtown, you think about, well, that's more walkability. So then you look at your parking and you say, is my. Normally in a building you would require 10 or 15 spaces. Maybe you say I bring that down to 10 spaces instead of 15. You reduce the amount of parking spaces, so you have a little bit. We talked about a little bit less impervious cover. You get a little more green space in there, you know. And the businesses understand. I mean, it's not something in downtown where you desperately need parking, but you look at maybe a little bit of give and take on the entire lots. You know, where you're not having as much parking, but you can get some green space in there. So some of our lots that I've looked at, I can tend to question, I see the site plan and it's like the building, the parking lot, there's like no trees left. And some of them might go back to when I read the definition of lot coverage, you know, we allow so much lot coverage and it doesn't include the parking. So so if our open space is like 20 minutes. It does. Lot coverage is, is um, basically anything that the water can't get through. So it's building, sidewalks, um, parking, driveways. Let me look at the definition. I'm just looking at it recently. So I guess Amy, your point for dimensional stuff for industrial. Yes. Um, the minimum lot area is 60,000 square feet. The open space is 25%. Maximum lot coverage is 50%. What page is that? Uh, and that is page Not just recently, but like within the last year or two, some of the industrials that come in front of us, I look at the drawing and it's like, it looks like it's all building and all parking lot. So I'm trying to figure out if there's... No, they're, they're not even anywhere close to 50%. But what what has been approved out on Bartlett Street? Is that what you're talking about? No, I wasn't. It was a different one. I'm trying to think. Maybe the one over by the railroad area or... Oh, not not yeah. Whitney Street. There's one... On But when I looked at it, it looked like a lot of parking, a lot of building. The and new cool one? Yeah. yeah. That's on Lyman? Lyman. Yeah. Yeah, Lyman and River. Or Calvin River. Mm -hmm. Railroad. Yeah. 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 But it's not, yeah, Lyman. A couple of those. 
and I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it was like almost the whole space was covered. And I was curious how there was 25% open space. And then I started looking at other towns like Westboro, and they had 40 to 60% open space. So I was gonna look into it, but I, I really haven't had time yet. It was just something in the back of my brain. Because I know um, with the new industrial, there's been a lot of, you know, on Barley, there's been a lot of tree cutting. Or is it just on the trees? Yeah. But it says coverage shall not include areas paved at grades, the driveways, walkways, uncovered parking. Does that mean if you can only do 50%, but it says coverage shall not include areas paved for driveways, walkways, and uncovered, does that mean? Those don't count as part of 50%. That's the way I was reading it. What page do you want to use? I'm on page, I have the old book. I'm on page 7 7. <coughs> I'm under definition, the very beginning.
is it really necessary? I mean, I'm looking, you don't really get many, other than 2016 when there were 10 special permits just for groundwater overlay. You don't get that many, but is that something that, you know, I don't remember why we stopped looking. There was something about the state already has more restrictive, so why do we even have this one, two, and three? Yeah, well, we, the, um, when, when the, Town went to um, uh, came came off our wells, our individual you know, municipal wells, and went to um, getting all of its water supply from the MWRA. Um, we thought that there would be an opportunity to possibly um, looking at revamping the uh, groundwater protection overlay district and changing the bylaw um, to match up with with what the state has for area. We have areas one, two, and three. I believe the state has a one and a two. Um, but um, the, the determination has been made um, in conversations or discussions with DEP is that we can't um, ever officially take our wells offline and, and mothball them because what then happens is if you ever needed them in an emergency um, and or if you were to um, put your wells back online, you would have to meet um, all the new standards at that time as opposed to the standards when the wells were, you know, were first um, um, put, put in, dug, whatever the right term is. So, um, uh, so even though we do use MWRA water, um, the wells are not going to come offline. So we have to keep the groundwater, uh, you know, protect the groundwater um, as if the wells were online. Okay. So, so that's why we still will maintain the areas one, two, and three. Cool. Thank you. Any final comments, questions on that? Do you think that's something we can look at this year or for next year for bumping up the open space and any extra? For next year. 21. That, I mean, that's all up to you, but it, it couldn't be for this year. <laughs> so stuff for ATM 2020 is... No, 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 but that's just... It's it's a, it's, I know it's a big it's a project. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. okay. Yeah. That's all, okay, yeah. but it's, it's not like, is there a specific deadline? Um, no, um, well, I mean, I mean, not, it's, I mean, it's our own in... I mean, there is a deadline that will be coming, you know, sure. the same deadline every year from the town administrator as to when, you know, drafts need to go in and then when the warrant, you know, the draft warrant um, is prepared for the selectmen and then when it's closed. Um, and that's all in, you know, like a February, March, right, March? This year. Um, I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I think it's, yeah. Um, so, you know, so any bylaws that, that we're considering, we, you know, a staff, we should be, you know, working on them now. Um, you know, not maybe not this very second, but you know, we should be thinking about them now as opposed to you know January, February when you know the deadline is coming up. So uh, one of the things I want to bring up are a table of uses. Um, obviously, we're not going to get into specifics about um, certain applications at all, but just with technology evolving, um, things like that, I just feel that maybe we need to you know, turn this into a huge 100-page like, document, but maybe get some more detail behind these uses. Like I was just going through reading, like we still talk about CD-ROMs. Uh, <laughs> get rid of it, the next day someone will come in and want to revive some rum. But, um, you know, just get it more up to date, up to speed, because nowadays in this economy, people are just trying to find a new niche, something that's very innovative, and things that wouldn't exactly fit into any one of these categories. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how detailed do we want to get? Um, how high level? You know, just kind of, not just protect the boards, but help make life easier for the zoning enforcement officer as well, we um, work on these applications. Um, and comments on that, and again, let's not get the specifics about certain applications, but at a high level. Yeah. I'll just say that at our last meeting, and I was, I think, um, for the rezoning, Dick was around, you were around during the rezoning in 2009, 
Were you around, Fran? I was on the committee. You were on the committee. <laughs> so there's only probably three of us here. But um, even going back, I look now at some of the definitions mm -hmm. and how dramatically things have changed yeah. right. with some applicants who are coming before us. So we had a really thoughtful discussion at our last meeting. And I think that's something that we might try to tweak even for this town meeting. Mm -hmm. But definitely going through and trying to tackle some of them is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, we got rid of pig and weed and haberdasher. I did like hat maker, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I see the CD one. The yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but even like for business use, trade, retail store, I mean, that could be everything and anything. It's just. And I in terms of the use and then also the appeal process in general. So um, Kathy shared with us um, that information that came back from town council. If everyone had, if everyone had a chance to take a look at it. I just wanted to take a, a couple minutes here, um, next 20 minutes or so, if anybody had any additional comments or information that we would want to clarify or anything? Yeah, it was just the only thing I had to cover. It was an email that Kathy had shared us. Do you have a copy of it, Amy? Yeah, I have my copy. I don't have an Millie, I can make you a copy. Yeah. Does anyone else need one? I don't know if I don't actually one. saw that. Yeah. I'm trying to. So just to recap, um, we had asked, we had taken the vote at the last meeting. Yeah. Oh, okay, so take a minute. Why don't you yeah. take a minute and we'll pass it to that. And if you want okay. to she leaves that. Michelle, you had read it before. Yep. You're all set. Okay. okay. So the question that we had originally asked was, um, in terms of an appeal, if, if there was an instance where you wanted to question the use determination um, and wanted to actually appeal that determination, what is the, where, where is it that you can actually do that? If it's not at the board level, where and when, under what premise can you do that? So um, town council provided an answer um, regarding the different the availability for an appeal and when that could happen. 
Was there any area that anybody had any question on or didn't make sense or did you want to get additional clarification or any discussion? So I'm just going back and looking at it now. So it says the appeal period is 30 days. So So the way I'm reading that is the planning board, not saying that we're gonna appeal anything right now, I'm just saying, is this saying that we could appeal within 30 days? I know he says in most instances it's, so if we as a planning board wanted to appeal a building inspector's Interpretation, you'd have to do it within 30 days. No, no, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That? Yeah. No, the what this explains is that um, you don't have the ability, the, the state statute, the, there's no ability to appeal uh, an interpretation by the zoning enforcement officer. So, this 30 days involves if. Um, it's by a person who has um, an in inability to obtain a permit or an enforcement action. So if um, a permit is denied, if a building permit is denied, then that person can, you know, if for whatever reason, you know, they can't work it out with the building inspector, they can appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And then if a person um, has requested that there be some enforcement action taken. You know, someone's not complying by a decision or, um, you know, I, it, it's never happened here, so I can't really think of a solid example. But, um, so if, if they, if you have, um, as the state statute says, if you're aggrieved um, by the fact that there was an enforcement action taken, then that you can appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals in 30 days from you know, not getting any action. So there's not the ability for a board to, or a person to appeal a zoning interpretation from the building inspector. I think I did look it up online though and there were a couple cases where they did. I'm not trying to say he's right or wrong, but I did find case law where it was in Massachusetts. If I read this correctly too, it states that the interpretation is for informational purposes only does not give permission to construct, alter, demolish, or change the use of a property. So that, I guess, would fall back on a bo uh, approval board. Is that correct? Um, what falls back on? So it just says for information, the interpretation, if I'm, read, if I'm reading this correctly, says the fate, it states on the face that the interpretation is for informational purposes only does not give permission, permission to construct, alter, demolish, or change the use of the property. So if, if it's just for informational purposes, and again, if I'm reading this correctly, then what does it mean? It's, th th it's not, well, I mean, the, the, the whole paragraph is the zoning interpretation form that mm -hmm. our building inspector or zoning enforcement officer fills out is, that's not appealable. There's, not, there's nothing in the statute that you can't appeal that. It's an interpretation form that the building inspector, you know, someone fills it, fills it out. I mean, we've all seen them. They're, mm -hmm. they're in every application. So an applicant, you know, fills it out and says, this is what I plan on doing, you know, in such and such a zone, uh, you know, wh whatever. They, I mean, there's a, you know, Bob's got a form for it. So they fill that out and they give it to Bob and then he, um, goes through the zoning and determines, you know, if it's allowed, is it not allowed, do you need a special permit, um, is it, you know, do you have to, I mean, we don't tell people to apply for variances, but I mean, you know, it's your choice if you want to go apply for a variance. Um, do you need, you know, groundwater, do you need design review, so it, so he filled that portion of it out. So that's the zoning interpretation form. So then that's the first step that, you know, that someone, you know, comes into town hall and asks if they can, <coughs> you know, do something on their property. Okay, so then in that form, then based on the zoning interpretation, 
the, then there's a, a set of special permits or whatever else is needed in order, based on that interpretation or based on what that use is, you then get a subset of all the special permits that you need. So it sounds like he's saying, by way of, by, by the action of the zoning board is when the decision is made. Right, so, 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 so someone takes the, the zoning interpretation form basically kind of lays out someone's roadmap for them as far as you know what section of zoning it's either allowed in, is a special permit by, or you need a variance, and what else you have to do. Um, I don't have one in front of me, so I don't have, I, I mean, Bob's got all kinds of boxes and stuff to so check. So if, if the use is not a decision, if this use form is not a decision, <coughs> right. then, and, we, and it looks like any, after any decision, it kicks off another 30 days, so no, the, the the zoning interpretation form is 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 just that. Like, not, not every town has a zoning interpretation form. We so we happen to have one here in Northborough that you know as the applicant finds very helpful. You know, whether it's a homeowner, you know, a, or or a business. Um, so then after you get that, then you decide. You know, as the as the, the applicant whether you want to go through the process or not. So then you apply and um, you, you then go to, you know, whichever board the applicable board is, and then you get your decision. And if, and if the applicant or a, another board or, you know, a, a, a party that has standing, if they are aggrieved by that decision, then that's where the 20 day appeal period kicks in. And that's the, and that's what's further explained in the email from town council. And the 30 day appeal has to do with if someone is aggrieved by a decision of the building inspector, then the decision being whether or not they get a permit, a building permit or not, or if, if someone requested enforcement action and that enforcement action wasn't followed through by the building inspector, then they then a person can appeal that to the zoning board of appeals. Okay, so if if as a board we see the use come through and we question the use determination, what as a board can what is our role in this? What is our action? What so because if if we're experiencing that at the end of the line. And if the interpretation form is not a decision, it's just informational only, mm -hmm. it would make sense that when the, oh, Michelle, go ahead. Okay, so I've been through this process where I filled out an application for a zoning interpretation request. And um, he, you know, for me it was a sign. And we said, you know, here are your dimensional requirements. Here's the process. And, you know, here's what you need to do, which is basically what you just explained, sort of roadmap. Doesn't approve it, doesn't deny it, just says, you know, this is what you need to do. I think what your question is, is what if you have something you're like, wow, that seems a little off. I think that means that the zoning interpretation officer, the way he's interpreting your zoning is different than the way you're thinking and then the zoning needs to be changed, mm -hmm. right? So if you said, you know, we need a sidewalk here and he's like, you didn't see it. And then you say, well, maybe that was too gray and then we need to go back and look at, do you actually need a sidewalk there? You know, something's in your zoning that's allowing him to make that interpretation the way it is. So I would say, you know, it's almost like we talked tonight about why are these use variances or use uses happening in special permits? You know, you need to go back and look at your zoning. So to your question is, if he gets an interpretation form and he says, yeah, I think this use is allowed, but you're like, well, how did you get that? Mm -hmm. Then somehow through his interpretation of reading your zoning and maybe to what Amy said, maybe you become a little more black and white and less gray in that interpretation of whatever you know, so, and, and, and in this situation, which, whatever, you know, he's looking at, he's, he's, going, he's going to the opposite side of what you thought he would, you know, approve, make this interpretation, then maybe you become more black and white, as Amy said. Do, do you become more restrictive in your description, mm -hmm. more descriptive and, you know, less gray? Because maybe it's the less, the more gray that gets you into the problems that, you know, you're saying, this is a question that you had asked the ZBA. Is the grades getting us into these problems and do we need to become more descriptive mm -hmm. in um, 
or zoning? I think for all sides, not, I mean, for us, for the building inspector and for the applicant, because if he's, you know, then he could open up a lawsuit against the town too, you know, saying, well, I read it this way and you're reading it that way. And uh, when I read the bylaws, there's a very specific point that says if it's not permitted, it's prohibited. And we've been mm -hmm. talking about that for years. Mm -hmm. But recently, in the past year, a lot of things are coming up, and I read it like, well, it's not permitted, so it must be prohibited. Oh, no, I think it fits over here. So I feel there's a lot of gray in creativity, and I mean, not that that's a bad thing, but I think it's hard. It's hard for Bob, it's hard for the boards, it's hard for the applicant. Like, then if it says, if it's not permitted, it's prohibited, is anything actually prohibited? Because it seems like everything seems to find a place. Is there anything that's really prohibited? So then how could we always stay ahead of it? We'd always have to guess like how is it going to be unless when a zoning determination is made they were actually notified at the time that it's made so that it's not, you know, X amount of time later mm -hmm. where we suddenly we see it and we, we have the application's next week and we don't really know how this even fits into our bylaws. Well, that's why I talked about how in design review there's a three-step process. And maybe the applicant comes before you and says, hey, I want it to look like this. And by the way, my front door is going to be pink. And you're like, oh, no, we're not having a pink door mm -hmm. to sit down, right? So you need to go back and bring us something more palatable to accept. And you know, and then you go to your step two and then step three process. Maybe, and I don't know whether you can even do this, Kathy, but maybe some, you know, and then zoning interpretations. You, I don't know how you'd even be able to manage that because... He must do a ton of zoning interpretations. Oh, yeah. I mean, right. people, he probably does yeah. four or five a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, if he does 100 a month, I mean, do you, does the board want to look at all 100 of them? Well, I would say yeah. just the one, in my opinion, please, I didn't want to keep it up, but the ones that are at least coming before, not so much like if you need a <coughs> permit or a bathroom or anything like that, but more like if it's an application coming to us, we know it's coming to us six months later. Maybe we're just aware of it as it's coming out to fruition, so mm -hmm. then, like we're ahead of it anyway, and we can kind of like. Maybe you want to look at the uses, you know. Because mm -hmm. so, I, I think it's hard, use. because Bob wasn't part of the 2009 zoning decisions when he yeah. said, "Well, let's do this because we want it to go the town to look like this or do mm -hmm. this," you know. When you guys took part in the 2009 zoning decisions, you knew what you had in mind. Mm -hmm. And we've gone through a couple of zoning inspectors since Bob hasn't been here that long. So he reads our bylaws, but he doesn't know what the intent of some of the things were. So I find it, unless he's listening to our meetings when we're writing the zoning, or if he goes back and reads the intent of the 2009 bylaws, if they're too gray, then it's, it's hard for him have you noticed anything from 2008-2009 that sort of didn't pan out the way that maybe the committee thought at the time? Or oh, yeah. I think if you look on Main Street, you look at, I mean, Kathy, we, we thought about how nice it would be to pull the buildings forward, you know, to the front of the street. And the one time we did that, it didn't work out. Um, but that was a unique situation. But you would find also that a lot of lots don't allow it. And primarily that um, a lot of developers prefer to have the parking in front. So that's sort of a transitional. We were hoping that the transition, I mean, 10 years later, we were hoping that that transition would take in place. We'd have those buildings move closer to the front with the parking in back. And of all the buildings, I would say maybe one just happened mm -hmm. on Main yeah. Street. And the majority of them have the parking in the front, mm -hmm. you know, or on the side. Um, so, and, and they don't like to have the parking in back. They'll be pretty vocal about it. They'll tell you, we don't like it. We don't like that part of your zoning. You know, we feel like our clients and our customers don't prefer it that way. And although we had a, some sort of an envision of it, it doesn't seem to work for each one. You know, so that's a classic example. I was going to bring that up tonight, but that's a classic mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. of, you know, and then you have those long, narrow lots that just don't work for it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a perfect example is the one right next to the cleaners that we just approved, where they wanted the building up front and then it went up back with the parking in the front, you know? 
And I think that's probably happened all the way down Route 20, mm -hmm. including the right, one right. where um, you know, the tavern on the square is. Mm -hmm. It's another perfect example of where they didn't want to do it. So. Yeah. Okay, but use-wise, have you seen anything that just isn't what was intended, or the focus wasn't really used since back in 2008, 2009? Oh, no, the entire use table was redone. Yeah. Oh, okay. The entire zoning bylaw, except for the groundwater section, was redone. I think it would be a really good exercise, because I did look at some of the use numbers. In some years, they were fairly high, and, but it could have been the shop's way that did it. In some years, they're, they're not as high, you know. Um, you know, you get 12, you get 10 at some year. So it might be worthwhile looking back at what those uses were and was it in the geographic area. And maybe it was just in the shop's way, which we're talking about now. That should have been all commercial anyways. It wasn't industrial, and that's where you get your use variance from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of use variances yeah. in that section. Well, I think the one thing that um, makes me a little concerned is that when they start to intersect or, you know, that the, blur the lines become blurred is that like we see in some cases where you actually you don't have to then go to design and review, or you don't have to follow the commercial um, guidelines because you're not a commercial, or like that you get to circumvent, not even really intention, intentionally and maliciously, but just by way of our bylaws, if you get pet, if you go with a certain use and perhaps that's a little questionable, you can circumvent a little bit some things you would normally want to see for that use had it been, mm -hmm. you know, that the business was in the right, swimming in the right lane. So that those things make it difficult, I feel like, for a board when you see that. How do you, so the things start to slip through the cracks. So not that I want to go through the exercise of going through every single bylaw or line by line, but how do we not let things fall through the cracks like that? Or does anyone else observe that or any thoughts on that? Third section and update it, and I don't know how we get around it. Is there a copy somewhere of the 2008-2009 um, changes, just to kind of like follow the path at all? Um, yeah, we, we probably have the 2009 bylaw. Oh, so it's it, just that one year. It wasn't a multi-year. No, I mean, it was a multi-year project to get to okay. that, and then it it was brought to the 2009 town meeting. Originally, it started off as just a let's let's just do. Um, gosh, it was so long ago, but it, it because it what it, it, it morphed into a, a, an enormous project um, because I think what we originally thought we hired a consultant and we were like you know we formed a zoning subcommittee and um, and we looked at it saying okay you know let's let's start um, let's just update the bylaw and you know a couple of months into it. It, it, you know, the committee and the consultant and myself realized that this is this is not an update. You know, if because if you touch, you know, this section, it touches, you know, six more sections, and then if you, you know, go to that section, then it, it you know, the, the, because each section is, is, even though it's a standalone subject, they're completely intertwined. Mm -hmm. So what we ended up doing was, you know, applying for additional money, and we changed the contract and. It expanded the project to at the committee's request that it was a complete rewrite of the zoning, and um, and so it ended up being like France. Are you still here, France? Yes. Um, it was um, every Monday. Oh my God. Eighteen months, <laughs> two and a half hours. It, um, but but it was it, it so it was a huge it was a huge project, and so that um, and that all came out of the community development plan, which was kind of like our mini master plan in between master plans. And um, so, uh, you know, th I think there's the potential, you know, when the master plan is completed that, you know, it's probably a process that you want to go through again. Because, um, you know, zoning isn't, isn't stagnant. I mean, you don't, right. you know, you don't want to go, you know, if you're going to town meeting every year with 15 articles, then you got an issue with your zoning bylaw. Right. <laughs> you know, but right. if you're going with a couple every year, you know, that's a good thing. You know, it, it, again, it's evolving, you're updating it, it's, you know, technology is changing. Um, but I mean, I I could definitely foresee that there's another zoning subcommittee, you know, project that comes out of the master plan. Um, but I actually think this is a good snapshot. What we got tonight, all of these, you know, from the DBA of mm -hmm. what's working and what's not. Mm -hmm. 
And I think you probably can see some sort of consistent mm -hmm. thread through this. And then what, what we didn't have time to do, um, I mean, this is kind of off the subject of the appeal, Carrie, but um, you know, back on the, the tallies that we did for the VBA, um, what, um, what Debbie did when we first did this project, like back, you know, it's like almost 20 years ago, um, we uh, pulled out all the parts of every decision so that every, you know, when we did this with the VBA, everyone knew, oh, okay, you know, that, that um, dimensional variance that was granted for, you know, 6 Main Street was because, you know, and we, you know, we had the backup material so that you could look at it and go, oh, that's, that, you know, that's what it was for. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think you're going to need it all the way back to 2002, but, you know, I'm thinking maybe for like for the past five years, you know, we can pull that out for the, um, you know, for, for one of the future meetings. Okay. So I guess what I want to get down to the bottom of, and I don't know if it's clear in here to us, is if the zoning interpretation request form is only informational, then when does it become a set in stone? It's only when the ZBA enact, takes action that it becomes actually the use, but where do we have the chance to question the use? Like where is our opportunity to talk about <coughs> use, whether it's the planning board or ZBA or whoever? So if, if they're coming to, if the applicants are coming with the application to the meeting, and it's assumed to be the decision, but it's actually not, it's just informational. Mm -hmm. Where is that point? And I think that's what that resident was um, asking about when we brought this discussion, like where is the place where you can talk about it? Right. And I just don't know that this is answered, like, okay, if it's not that form, and if it's, not, if it's only when it's a permit that's shown here, where is the place where somebody can say, I, I just don't, know, this use seems weird to me. Well, I mean, to me, I mean, the way I see it, is that the place for the discussion is at the actual meeting where the permit or the hearing where the permit is um, evaluated or, or determined. That, do I have that right? I mean, that's really where it is. So I guess if there was a question whether the interpretation was maybe off or invalid or not right or whatever, that should happen at whether it's at the ZBA or Okay. Are there any questions in general about this section? So I'm just trying to get what Anthony said. It's, so the ZBA could question the use at the hearing. Is that what we just said? Yes. Yes. I mean, they, they can ask, you know, questions of the building inspector, but, you know, you also have to, um, you know, whether you, whether you agree with it or not, I mean, there's, you know, there's a, a process that every applicant goes through in town. I mean, some applicants, you know, we meet with over like a two year period. Um, you know, other applicants, we may meet just a couple of times in a couple of months, mm -hmm. you know, before they, you know, go through, you know, start with their application process. So, I mean, sometimes those meetings are, we call them development review meetings and they're on the staff level. Um, but I mean, um, most often it's myself, the building inspector, and the town engineer, and if wetlands are involved, the conservation agent. So, you know, we'll meet with the applicant, and we'll, again, we'll go through, we'll evaluate their use, we'll, we'll go through, you know, where it is or isn't allowed in the zoning bylaw, and then what your process is. You know, so each one of us will go through, um, you know, what, what our, you know, the, the board that, that we're staff liaison, what, you know, what is it that you need to fill out for that board? What are the time frames? Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of times it's, um, uh, you know, reviewing, you know, preliminary, uh, you know, plans for, you know, what they're proposing to do. And, um, you know, when we're reviewing it, you know, two, three, you know, sometimes four times, depending on the complexity of the project. And so once someone gets through, all that in-house process, then they will file, you know, their either their application with the planning board or their application with the ZBA, um, and then you know, and then then the whole public hearing, you know, process starts. It just seems like a lot of work if they go through two year meeting with town staff, and then they have the chance of it being denied. Like to me, that's big boys. They know, they I mean, know. that's okay. right. yeah. I mean, they're that's. I mean that's what this, you know, business is. I mean that they they are going before the boards asking whether or not it's 
you know, they need special permits and or variances. You know, um, I mean, that's... So, Terry, you had a question where a resident asked, um, at what point along the way can you have, like, a checks and balances before it actually right. gets to a planning board or ZBA and there's a whole package together? And I think Kathy just said that they review things on a developmental along the way. I mean, I don't know if that's part of the ZBA and planning board having another discussion down the line. Do they want to be updated on these, you know, developmental checks, like someone's coming in and talking to us right, about this? Right. You know, um, at which point is it too early? Can they even talk about it? I mean, there's things that maybe staff can't talk about, maybe they can talk about. I mean, I did think from a resident standpoint, if they're asking that question, that would be the only early point that you'd get before you get the package before the mm -hmm. board. Everything else is sort of done behind the scenes where staff, that's what their jobs are. They're hired to do this and then get everything together for the boards. Mm -hmm. You know, if the board wants to, <coughs> to take that process and put it forward a couple of steps, I mean, that's what we have to figure out. Can we do this? Is it too disruptive? Is it too early? What if you, you know? put, what if you put in the process, if there is such a thing, if somebody's coming to town staff and saying, I want to do this, help me understand what I'm going to need, or do I need special permits or variances, and the process is, and then a part of that response is, if you'd like, you can, we think it's going to be the ZBA or the, or the planning board you're going to need uh, approvals from, um, to save yourself some time and effort, would you like to present to them the scope and idea before it goes further to see if they have further questions. I mean, would my completely off base here, or does that make sense? We had that not too long ago. Right. Someone came to us for a preliminary. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you'd want to do that with everything, but well, not, no, I'm saying give the off. Uh, <coughs> Well, and that's what the public hearing process is all about. Right, which is almost on the other end. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. the process in Massachusetts. You know, yeah. it's no it's no different in North Road than it is in yeah. Shrewsbury or Warren, Mass. You know, it's, it's the same process that mm -hmm. every board has to follow. Okay, so it sounds like in terms of this particular description, are there any areas for clarification or anything that we want to further keep open for figuring out or no? My question was going to be too specific and there's still open applications so we can't. Well, no, that's a great point. So maybe after, so that we don't get too specific, um, maybe we revisit when some of those applications are closed so that we don't get ourselves into the jam with that and then can be a little bit more specific about some issues that have come up and need some sort of, uh, something has to be fixed because the process is not working. It's not working well, in my opinion. So uh, maybe after those close up, we can revisit. Um, we also got an interpretation on the one of the applications for light manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of as it relates to this, what's specifically on this paper, but not outside of what they've decided here. Um, is there anything here that we want to further clarify? So for my my questions would be too specific. So again, I can't. I think for um, for something like this, in this case, so for this particular application, it sounds to me like um, there are certain performance, let's see, what was the position there? There are performance use standards specific to this type of use. And what I don't think we have the expertise in is to actually decide, determine if this proposal meets the performance use uh, criteria. So what I would want to do is you're getting into you're you're talking about <coughs> a proposed use that's before you next month. You know, uh, whereas we have a list of how it fits the criteria for the first pro for the first application, how 
how does it actually fit the criteria in the second instance? I'd be, that's something, like it lists whatever it was, five different criteria level. How does it actually fit that criteria? I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if we just sort of recompose the letter that we sent to the zoning board with the reasons why we thought it didn't, why, if you could justify why we would be off base on that. You know what I'm saying? Mm. No, not really. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, he's not gonna, he's not gonna, he's not gonna tell you what, like, you should or shouldn't ask the ZBA. I mean, I have your, la your, no. your letter, I mean, I don't Right, but I, I think don't. on the letter, it sort of points why we thought it didn't fit. And if he could sort of say why he thinks it does, parallel, you, you know, maybe give us a balance on, on what we say versus what his interpretation is. Is that possible? Uh, uh, well, I can provide him your your memo. Yeah. So that, that so that he's got your kind of you know thinking process. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think when you go back, just back to four twenty five, when they talk about light manufacturing, like he talks about the standards of noise and light and gets a little more details. Then he talks a little bit more further down about you know permits and such, and then he talks a little In bit more, right? Yeah. The neighborhood, the environment. So that you get a sense of like, oh, okay, I understand, right? right. But on this one, it's literally two sentences. So well, there's no. There's, I mean, there's yeah. no. I, I, again, you, you yeah. know, I. They write whatever yeah. you know. They're the attorneys, yeah. and we, you know, we ask for their advice, and this is what they yeah. give us. Um, so uh, my my take on this is that because the first one is about in an industrial use. There, you have performance standards in the bylaw right. for industrial uses. Mm -hmm. So my guess is, is that's why he brought that in there. Right. Right. You know, I didn't talk about performance standards when right. I talked to him. Yeah. You know, so he, you know, they know our their our bylaw better mm -hmm. than we do. Right. So um, now I think it's a little more complicated because you have some more. What, we're in, what is it commercial? Or how the use is in a residential. Where you're right, it doesn't have performance standards. There's no checks and balances. So I like no noticed by the neighbors. No additional parking in the front yard, which it would have on their plot plan. Has that in the front yard? Okay. Okay. So there's that. There's maybe just sharing our letter, and then anything else for that. Do we need to take a vote on that or anything? No, but I do think we should just stick with the use like that we're questioning and not, as we said, not get into a discussion on it. Mm -hmm. So, so, so how, how does the, um, the application fit the criteria of, of the home occupation use? And I'll cite the, you know, the section that, that he, you know, is coming in under. And then, um, and then provide a copy of the, of your, um, Memo to the ZBA. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, did um, town council see the whole section of home occupation use? Like, would they see? They have the bylaw. They have a copy of the bylaw. Okay. Course. Yes. Okay. So we don't have to look through that. Okay. Anything else on this, or do we need to hold it, hold the rest? The other thing is the, oh, so, and then in terms of the letter, so we obviously sent a letter about use. We have these additional clarifications. Um, I think that the, so our letter was read and that's fine. Um, is there anything that based on hearing this back from town council, I guess seeking further clarification kind of leads us at a standstill with that anyway in terms of like updating that stance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think so. Okay. So we're good with that still? Okay. Okay. So then we have, do we need a motion on that or anything? Or no. Do, just that you, so you're all, you know, obviously you're all in agreement and, and that's, that's what I'll forward. Yeah. And if, if you could just include me so that I don't just to get through the answer, I can see the out and the yeah. in. I'm sorry. It's just in writing versus home. 
Um, okay, so then we are, oh, still a little over. So then just in terms of the next item on the agenda is minutes. So did everybody have a chance to review? I think, do we have a sheet? Just, just the fifth. And I have copies. I mean, they, they, they went out yesterday, but I have, I, I have copies if anyone needs them. Okay. No, actually, I gave them to you. I think these things are old ones. I'm thinking, wait a minute, why do I just have... What? Uh, that's, that's what I read them. Okay. I read them yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> like, I thought we did these already. <laughs> yes, you did approve those. Yeah. <laughs> did everyone have a chance to look at the minutes from September 5th? And we don't have the 17th. Correct. Yeah. Did I, haven't, I haven't read them yet, but I wasn't here either, so... Oh, you're going to have to make them. I was fine with them. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the September 5th minutes. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Um, then for next meeting dates, actually for this, this is now October 17th, and that's in the library. Oh, yeah, that's then? correct, yeah. Okay. So the next meeting is the 17th in the library. Yeah. And then um, we have the next couple meetings here. You mentioned um, an election day on the, is that the 5th? Or we're not, that's not the 5th? The, um, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, you don't fall, you mm -hmm. don't, uh, oh, that's right, the, no, the, it's the, um, a state election, but there's not a town <coughs> election. Okay, so the 5th is a yeah. big meet, yeah. Wilson, then? Okay, yeah. so then the 5th is fine. Yeah, so the 17th, you got a full agenda. You have three hearings, or oh, actually two hearings, and um, and you've got three applications to review, and you have all of those three. Two involve hearings, and one um, doesn't require a hearing, but it's you know it's a site plan decision. And then the, even though probably nobody's thinking of December yet, I just wanted to ask you tonight: Do typically we only meet once in December? Um, the beginning of December, so I don't know if people wanted to make that decision tonight or not. I think we should wait, because it would depend on like the hazardous waste bylaw and the solar bylaw. We might need to pair. I think it's too early to make that decision. I agree. Sure. Okay. And then we also have the 24th at the library, and that's for the master plan. Yep, that's the... Yeah, and that public hearing will, you know, for, for you, that, you know, that I, it, you know, still need to advertise that and so forth. Okay, so that's the 24th. Okay, so those are our meeting dates, and other than that, we don't have any other business. Does anyone else make a motion to adjourn? Make a motion to adjourn the meeting.